Well, we're back, and uh, our next unit is going to be cultural geography. Cultural geography is how we, uh, different uh, groups of people organize themselves and their activities, uh, and how those cultures are distributed around the world and how they interact with each other. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of cultures around the world different beliefs, languages, uh, practices, and so forth. We're going to look at this kind of, in general, a bit more. And of course, you've got the uh, field of anthropology, which uh, talks about uh, just the study of human societies. And of course, you have sociology, which also studies societies. And then cultural geography is kind of uh, overlaps into that in a lot of ways. Now, culture what culture is, it's a specialized behavioral patterns, understandings, and adaptations that summarize the lifestyle of the people. See, what do you do? What do you believe? Um, Here in the United States, here in the South, and say our culture is watch TV, we go to and from work, we um, enjoy going to sporting events. Um, so we have our church life, uh, we have our civic life, and we have our playtime um, video games, or going to the park, or working out, or whatever else. All part of specialized behavioral patterns, understandings, and adaptations, and summarize the lifestyle. Specialized behavioral patterns, understandings, adaptations. And it can be very subtle things too. Um, for example, certain gestures, they have certain cultural meanings. And those meanings shift from one society to another. In our society here in the United States, the West, generally a nod is generally referred to, generally accepted as indicating yes or approval. Shake your head no, meaning no, negative. How you don't agree. Let's say in some parts of India, just shaking your head back and forth it generally means yes. Uh, a handshake is a friendly gesture in uh, Western culture. It's a sign of friendship, a sign of respect. But uh, I suppose putting your foot up on a desk or a table. In Arab cultures, that is an extreme insult. It's a way of saying you're beneath in contempt, you're beneath, you're lower than my feet. Um, um, but in Western society, it has very little meaning at all. Now, culture traits. These are units of learned behavior in society. Okay, language, tools, games, rituals. Language is an important part of culture. It's how people you know, it's how people communicate with each other. Another example here: uh, rituals. Um, 
cultural understandings. For example, um, when your classroom teacher speaks, generally fall, all, students all fall silent. That is a cultural expectation. Graduation, you dress up in that gap, cap and gown, and you walk across the stage to uh, get your uh, degree. That is a common ritual. Christmas, that is a common Western ritual. Um, Christmas trees, gifts, and so forth, it's all it's a part of rituals built up over uh, many generations. Language, what language we speak. Um, our culture here, it's, we, speak, we generally speak English. Um, Mexico and Latin America generally speak Spanish, again, part of their culture. Um, certain expressions we use, those are um, part of our culture. And again, remember, you have a, an overarching culture sometimes, you have little subcultures and localized cultures and a larger culture sometimes. Um, and sometimes that can be certain act, certain uh, expression, how way certain expressions are used, what certain uh, games are played. For example, way up north, um, they, what, it, uh, what, what do people do this time of year when they, the ponds are frozen over because they can freeze over very thick, uh, very thick ice in uh, winter? Um, Wisconsin, Mi Minnesota, Michigan, New York. Uh, you play hockey, but hockey is not a game generally played down here in the South. Um, football. Everybody in America, especially in the South, knows what football is. You go to another country, even an English-speaking country, you say football, they're thinking soccer. Get a cultural difference. A certain um, Language traits are part of the culture. For example, in Eng England, they speak English, but uh, an apartment is sometimes called a flat. Uh, an elevator is sometimes called a lift. Slight difference in language. Those uh, idioms kind of mark part of English culture. Um, but here in the South, again, uh, American South, we refer to any generic carbonated beverage. What do we say? Coke. Uh, what kind of uh, yeah, so that's what kind of coke you want on dark pepper or on a Pepsi? Uh, but to go to other parts of the country, like say uh, up in the Midwest, you'd be like soda or pop. Parts of uh, New Orleans will say cold drink. We happen to be in an area where just certain expressions like coke are just the overwhelming of the word used. Again, part of Southern culture. Culture traits. Culture complex. Here. This is the inter individual cultural traits that are uh, fundamentally interrelated. Now, certain cultural ideas overlap. Uh, so we'll go back to uh, Christmas, um, celebrated in many cultures around the world. Generally, you refer to Christmas. You uh, people know what you're talking about. Um, we have certain traditions about gift giving and trees, that, Christmas trees that uh, are kind uh, seen in places all over the world where Christmas is practiced, even if they don't speak English. Show a picture of Mickey Mouse. Everybody around the world knows who Mickey Mouse is. That's a cult. Mickey is a part of our culture, but it's also part of the, the global culture. And all these other little cultures, how they interact, it's the way things they know about each other in different parts of the world is, yeah, Mickey Mouse. It's our cartoon here. The culture complex. Culture system. Culture system, um, 
communication of cultural traits and complexes shared uh, by people in an area is how are these traits now, these uh, ideas transmitted? Um, example, television is a great cultural transmitter. Radio, same thing, great cultural transmitter uh, via internet. Sometimes just by word of mouth. An old, old story, as in folk tales, you may have heard your whole life. Um, but uh, you see them being repeated in other cultures for generations over the past several centuries. Again, sometimes it's passed by word of mouth. That is a cultural system in how people interact with each other, how people communicate cultural ideas. Now, how culture is shaped and determined, well, there are a lot of different theories on that. Um, what is the idea of environmental determinism? Determinism. The physical environment shapes people's activities and beliefs. In many ways, that's true. We've talked about in this course how weather shapes our different activities. You can go back to the hockey example again. That can only be played in an environment where it's very cold. But only with modern technology, such as uh, modern air conditioning, modern ice rink technology, uh, uh, can they have indoor arenas where hockey can be played in certain localities. So that's why Dallas has a uh, hockey team. Well, Los Angeles has a hockey team, but uh, again, that's because of modern technology, how that affects culture, but generally, physical environment shapes our activities in ways it does, like um, certain sporting activities. Um, think of the beach. Uh, you live in a warm climate close to the beach. Your local culture is shaped by beach culture. Hang out at the beach and just enjoy the water all day. But that's, again, that's in areas where people can get there and enjoy it. When the weather's good enough, people get to enjoy it. You don't have a lot of people surfing in the Arctic Ocean, but the Arctic Circle. It just the physical environment there makes that, shall we say, inadvisable. Environmental determinism. The idea of possibilism. Possibilism. This is the idea that uh, people, rather the environment, are the dynamic force of cultural development. It is people make their own culture. People shape culture more than environment. So it goes back to the old question, what's the real factor and what determines how people uh, turn out? Is it uh, culture or is it nature? Um, and as we see the culture, uh, cultural developments, particularly as uh, interactions with large groups of people, we see it's a lot of both. Um, some of it is environment, some of it is individual choice. And yes, in the end, what you do, that is a matter of choice. But those choices are often shaped by what do you have available. 
You're going to go skiing in the mountains in uh, January. Um, well, it's kind of hard to do when you're in South Carolina. No snow, and there aren't very many mountains except uh, the extreme western end of the, of the state. Um, Texas, yes, it has mount, a few mountains, but they aren't, um, they don't have enough snow to produce snow skiing, so that limits your choices right there. Things like language and expressions, those are choices we make. How we shape our language, um, how we dress. If we may dress weather appropriate, the weather may demand that we dress very warmly for a warm winter environment or very cool for a uh, tropical environment. But the colors, the patterns we use, that is still a matter of choice. So possible. And yes, when new people move into an area, that does shape the culture. So all the things that exist outside of uh, environment, weather, temperature, uh, some of it is old traditions, uh, old cultural habits, and beliefs and choices. Um, Cultural landscape. Now the Earth's surface is modified by human action. Changes due to culture. All sorts of examples of that. For example, uh, we're a technological society, so um, and we need certain centers for distribution for trans certain transportation systems, um, and certain ways of getting point A to point B, and certain important features within large areas that we need. Um, so yes, we have cities with a lot of houses and a lot of concrete. Again, that's the cultural landscape, or think of uh, down the street here. We have Memorial Stadium. That is how that is the landscape was changed to produce a big football stadium, which is a, a part of our culture. Just a minor example. Or may drive out on eighty two, and you see. Uh, a couple of churches on the, uh, along the side of the highway, or a couple of churches even being built. Notice that the forest, with the trees were cleared out, um, the earth was turned over, the um, topography turned from hilly to more flat, and buildings being put up. The cultural landscape was transformed from woods to an area of worship. cultural landscape. And in all this you have your uh, cultural subsystems. Technological, sociological, and ideological. A technological subsystem. These are materials, objects, and techniques uh, by which a people live. For example, the internet. That's a big way of how our culture lives now. Um, it's a big cultural change in the last 30 years because of the uh, internet. Um, people use cars to drive, so we need, we need paved roads. So paved streets here outside, that's part of our technological subsystems. Radio and TV transmission towers you see every so often. Again, those are technological subsystems. 
materials, objects, and technologies. Just a couple of examples. Rows and rows of uh, miles of uh, electrical wire and old telephone lines. Uh, those were those are technological subsystems. Again, tools by which we live. Electricity and the telephone, especially the old landline systems. Sociological subsystem. That is. Um, sum of expected and accepted patterns of relationships uh, as formed through economic, political, military, religious, and familial associations. Patterns of relationships. For example, um, preachers, uh, who they are, uh, who I would call what would uh, title we use for them, uh, and uh, how they interact in our society, how we interact to them, that's a big part of our cultural beliefs, that is a sociological subsystem. Um, military, what's our relationship with the military? Um, say here in this country, it's a uh, um, a vol all volunteer military. Uh, members of the military are just ordinary people. Like say brothers, sons, cousins, uh, sisters, um, sons and daughters. So that's the way we kind of interact with people. It is people we know. Expected and accepted patterns of relationships. Technological subsystems of things, sociological is the people. The ideological, which is the ideas, the beliefs, the knowledge of culture, the ways they're communicated. So there are all sorts of ways we communicate these things, especially cultural ideas. Um, they can be written down. Uh, they can be on TV or on um, uh, the internet. They can also be uh, expressed in terms of certain gestures. Um, sadly, somebody gets up and just starts cussing for no reason. Um, that's generally taboo in our culture, and the way people want to know that they disapprove is they'll just give them a look, a disapproving a glance at them, knowing that they stepped out of line. It's something they shouldn't do. Um, children, um, except parents teach their children to use certain phrases to show respect. Please, thank you. Um, so, passed down from one uh, generation to another. Somebody sticks out their hand in our culture, we know what that means. Uh, from years of experience, we don't need to be uh, told or reminded what it is. It is a handshake, that's a gesture of friendship. Certain beliefs, uh, certain ideas. Next day, religion forms a lot of these ideas and beliefs. Um, even people who don't necessarily subscribe to those religions here in Western culture, um, the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, these ideas are still transmitted throughout the culture. For example, the idea of the golden rule. Um, like I said, generally people, I say that phrase, people automatically know what I mean. They mean um, the golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. Um, the idea of karma, you reap what you sow. Never have to spend a day in Sunday school to know what you reap what you sow means in Western culture. 
and the certain ways these are transmitted. In our culture, all sorts of different ways. Gestures, looks, um, the uh, language, spoken language, written language, many different ways in which these ideas are communicated. They used to have what they called charm schools, which basically taught people the manners of high society. It uh, kind of took the rough edges off and kind of showed them how do you act um, with the most high and the most in different cultural situations. And that was another way with an ideal, another ideological subsystem. And the idea of innovation. You think of innovation in terms of technology, but it actually has a cultural connotation too. And the United States, especially the West, we love our gadgets. We are fascinated by technology. We live by technology. We're always ready to see what's the next big thing that's going to come out. We're excited about that. Um, but innovation, cultural terms, isn't necessarily technology. Though technology can have a huge impact on how culture operates. For example, just after a few decades of having a telephone place, we knew what a telephone ringing meant. It meant uh, someone's trying to call, so we need to pick it up and answer it. And that's a, one way a cultural idea is spread. Um, in cultural terms, innovation means changes to culture derived from ideas created by part of the group and adapted by the culture. Uh, when a group uh, resists a change or uh, doesn't really accept it, kind of stands out, that's considered a cultural lag. Okay, innovation, it can be if, for example, changes in technology, new gadgets, uh, new ways they're used. Um, it can also be uh, music. That's a very popular example in the United States. Um, all of a sudden, the new song's everywhere, and uh, just a few lyrics of it kind of start becoming part of the overall culture. Uh, just People just make little references to a song. Or how people start dressing. Uh, that is uh, a cultural innovation. Certain things go in and out of style. Um, up until the early 1960s, all men generally wore hats when they were outside, but to, by the early 1960s, they decided suddenly not to because cultural leaders like President Kennedy decided he wasn't going to wear a hat all the time. And that was a, it may seem like something very minor, but in cultural terms, that was a cultural innovation. Uh, But, uh, like I said, cultural lag, I mean, people that say uh, people refuse to get a TV set even though they may have had the means, or uh, people still want to dress 30 or 40 years out of date, um, even though they're newer, uh, and uh, perhaps some people may see, think uh, better looking ideas of uh, dress may be, but some people just resist it in a cultural lag. But innovation is happening in cultures all the time. And again, there are a lot of different ways it's pushed. Some people work very specifically to try to push certain images and certain ideas in a culture. Um, the, the new term is the influencer, the YouTube influencer, the uh, person who just basically has this channel and basically tries to spread ideas about culture, the way things should be. Um, That a lot of people pay attention to. Spatial diffusion. This is the process by which uh, uh, an organization, idea, or innovation spread. It can be spread by migration. 
example, the uh, system of English uh, laws and the political customs uh, moving to North America. Um, certain cultural ideas began coming to America after the United States came independence. Um, for example, St. Patrick's Day becoming such a popular holiday, even though most Americans are not Irish and not Roman Catholic, but it um, became a very, a very important part of American culture. And migration. Uh, contact with a new culture. Example of when Europe came in contact with a gunpowder from China, that affected the culture. Europe found new what started using gunpowder and guns in a battle warfare, and not because anybody's moving back, moving up in into uh, China or anybody from China moving into Europe is simply just contact to these cultures. For example, how uh, Japanese cartoons are very very popular right now, anime. That is simply from contact with a different culture. And also go back to the Mickey Mouse example. Now everybody around the world knows what Mickey, who Mickey Mouse is because of cultural contact, spatial diffusion, how these ideas are spread out. And or innovation. Changes in uh, technology, everything from light bulbs to the internet to uh, cultural ideas. Uh, baseball uh, and uh, as an innovation that uh, spread across the world, very, very popular in many areas, and uh, 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 American style music, jazz, blues, and rock came popular all over the world. That was cultural innovation. And how it spread around the world, that is the idea of spatial diffusion. Syncretism. of combining new with old. And all sorts of different ways this was done. Um, uh, some preachers, for example, sometimes will incorporate modern music and refer to modern cultural events um, into very ancient worship services. Make references to TV shows, try to make an important moral point. Um, for example, combining technology. Um, I've recorded these videos for a lot of classes, including classes on ancient history. That's combining very old knowledge with very new technology. That is syncretism, syncretism. That's one thing you have to understand about uh, culture as well is culture just doesn't just erase everything in front of it. It combines, it twists, it turns, it molds, it melts together. It's uh, uh, cultures uh, and so they adapt and they mix. It's not always even. Sometimes a little, some, a little something and a little more of another. And even some little piece of a third thing. And how it interacts and how they uh, combine to form new cultural ideas and new cultural elements and new cultural innovations. And a lot of that is a matter of choice, what appeals to people in certain areas. Again, based on their culture, their needs, their uh, heritage, history, and ideas. Now, amalgamation versus uh, assimilation. Amalgamation theory. Amalgamation theory. Now, society is receiving something. Uh, right, immigrant groups eventually merge into a uh, a larger uh, uh, culture. 
larger mainstream culture is the idea of the melting pot of cultures. I talked about uh, St. Patrick's Day it was brought over here by Irish Catholic immigrants. Uh, it was turned from a religious holiday into a celebration of being Irish. And on St. Patrick's Day in the United States, it's a big party. Everybody's Irish. Everybody has a good time. Everybody loves um, everything about Ireland. Celebration of Ireland. That's a that's amalgamation theory. Or also, um, the uh, Innovation Kids birthday parties of the last 20 years. The piñata. That is a result of a lot of people coming from Latin America, coming to the Americas and bringing um, a fun little party things like pinatas with them. Food is a very popular way, very popular, very common form of amalgamation theory. People go from one part of the world to another. They bring their um, cultural tastes and uh, food tastes with them. And sometimes that really gets very popular in Example, uh, a lot of foods that are popular in a lot of parts of Mexico became very popular in the United States. Um, Molly's, enchiladas, tacos, uh, so popular now that uh, some people sometimes talk about Tuesday as Taco Tuesday. Um, again, because of cultural amalgamation, combining some, uh, one cultural love of food became a pop, became a part huge part of a larger, newer culture. Pizza and uh, spaghetti, those are Italian dishes, but um, something you wouldn't have in England or Ireland or uh, uh, France or uh, Native American cultures, but Italians brought spaghetti and pizza and other great foods to the United States and came a huge very popular part of the larger culture of the United States. There's one thing about the United States is we're a mix of cultures. Um, um, everybody comes into the United States, they have something to offer and that's mixed into the larger culture. Amalgamation theory. And when cultural integration has occurred, that is called assimilation. Assimilation is not like the Borg on Star Trek. It's not always a bad thing. It's simply just when you get used to being part of a new culture. Um, people adapt with uh, new styles of uh, dress, uh, new languages, and so forth. Um, for example, they see people coming from different parts of the world who are dressed very differently. but. Uh, their children are dressed in very Western style and very Western fashions because those children adapted very quickly to American cultures, what they grew up with, being surrounded by American culture. Assimilation. Um, this cultural integration has occurred. There's also the idea of competition theory. That is, that sometimes uh, the original cultures aren't lost as a group, they fit into a uh, um, larger cultural mainstream, but uh, various facets can force a group to recall, to, uh, recall its culture, heighten it, and uh, defend it. For example, uh, Judaism. Um, most Americans if they have religion, it would be of Christian faith. But you have a lot of people, religious minorities. The rest of the time, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, um, they will dress and speak the same way as any other American. Um, same accents, same expressions, um, same love of baseball or football or basketball. But when it comes to religious time, times of religious uh, observance, they go back to it. They worshiped a very specific ancient um, style. Um, for example, Judaism, it's Sabbath day on Saturday. It's Hanukkah instead of Christmas. Um, 
in Islam. Um, day of worship, is, Sabbath day is on Friday. But also the uh, Now they're entering the month of Ramadan, which is after sunset, a, a time of family and reflection, and generally time of fasting for the day. Uh, again, going back to a particular cultural idea. Religion and language are the most common elements. In immigrant families, um, usually the first and second generation immigrants will almost always speak the language of their original culture. For example, people coming from Mexico and Central America, South America, they'll come to the United States, they'll be speaking Spanish. They'll be learning English and usually speak English with other English speakers, but with each other, they may start speaking Spanish. People coming from China will do the same thing, speak Chinese with each other, but uh, sometimes not even realizing it. and. Uh, but English with everyone else, um, so on and so forth. Many different examples of this. And yes, how do they do this? Start changing languages by accident. You have to understand with languages, when you're born with a language, you start speaking a particular language, you, uh, you think in, uh, say, you're born in an English speaking country, you spend your whole life thinking in English, speaking in English, reading in English dreaming in English, everything about you is in English. And when you go to a different area and you start speaking a different language, let's say you go to Japan and start speaking Japanese, you have to first form the ideas in English until you fully know Japanese, translate it into Japanese. Which means you have to stop and think about what you're saying and stop and think about what somebody else is saying in Japanese to you. So, in that case, uh, the uh, uh, you may be able to speak Japanese very fluently, but sometimes you're speaking maybe speaking to someone who knows English, or if English slips into the conversation, then a couple more, and pretty soon you're just by default without thinking about it uh, speaking English again. Because, for example, if you're born in an English-speaking country. Your ideas and words form in English that you really have to think about it. But if you're trying to speak another language, you have to you have to think about what you're trying to say and translate that into another language. But again, it's just how people interact. Um, remember, culture. It's the general beliefs and actions and activities of a, of a particular group of people. But in all that, manners. And manners basically are how one culture to another, how you show respect to people. And people coming from one culture to another, sometimes it's hard to learn all these little social cues and these ideas. What is the way you show respect to people? Maybe obvious in one culture, but not so obvious in a culture you're not familiar with. It just takes time to learn. The idea of folk culture. Heard of folk music? There is folk culture. It's the traditional life of a homogeneous, cohesive, self sufficient group. It's either isolated or Restricted outside influences. Now, if you think of the Amish in, uh, in Pennsylvania, um, somewhat homogeneous, somewhat uh, self sufficient uh, culture, that uh, certain traditions they, that go back for several centuries based on uh, religious beliefs. Uh, before the advent of radio, television, and the internet, there were a lot of uh, folk cultures in the United States. Um, example, uh, Swamp areas outside of New Orleans. Very difficult to get from one area to another, so we have a lot of cultures that's kind of grew and cemented on their own. Um, built their own ideas, their own uh, rituals, uh, their own stories. 
They could go up to uh, the mountain areas, uh, the Appalachia, very isolated areas, and have very specific ways of doing things that were maybe somewhat unfamiliar to people from outside those areas, folk culture. Um, and in folk culture, it's tradition that controls folk culture. You don't have a lot of innovation in these cultures. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just it's just the way things are. They don't have a lot of outside influences, and also they don't have a lot of means to uh, create new changes in the culture. But generally, it's tradition, the way things have always been done, because those ways have generally worked very well for that society. Now, folk culture, again, this is uh, uh, material, yeah, the material culture, the physical things used in everyday life, the artifacts of it. Uh, for example, in certain folk cultures, uh, might be certain musical instruments that uh, they use in that area but nowhere else. Or certain tools they use for farming, whatever else that they use in that area but really nowhere else material culture, or the non-material culture, uh, intangible things such as uh, the oral tradition, music, and so forth. Again, stories are a very important part of folk culture. How you, it's how you trans, one way ahead, transmit values and ideas and traditions that keeps the folk culture alive. And music, of course, is an important uh, artistic expression, expression of imagination. So that is a little bit on cultural geography. We'll start talking a little bit more about language uh, next time. Language is an extremely important part of uh, any culture and how people communicate with each other. And culture, of course, is about all about how people interact with each other. So that's it for now. Good, stop there and go on for next time.